Hello, hello everybody. Today we're going to talk about object detection. And object detection is the computer's capability to understand images by putting tight bounding boxes around the different objects in the image and then classifying each bounding box to its correct type. In this case, an airplane. And this uh, is um, Joseph. And he's one of the researchers behind the YOLO algorithm. It's really one of the most amazing algorithms today in object detection. And what he showed in the TED conference last, last April is really impressive. He took a video of the audience and all of the detections of the dozens of people, including very small objects they were holding, are being done in real time using his algorithm with a regular video camera he is holding in his hand. And uh, Joseph is uh, really, uh, with his algorithm, really pushing the boundaries of the state of the art of object detection towards algorithms which are more and more real time, while other researchers are really pushing the boundaries of the state of the art towards more and more accurate algorithms. This is what we're going to talk to about today. My name is Idan Basuk, and I'm the AI team leader at ADOC, uh, where for the last year I've been working on object detection algorithms for the medical imaging domain. And I really think that for uh, those of you looking for the next product uh, to work for, uh, to build for your company, or for the next idea to found a startup on, object de detection could be a really good opportunity for you. And the reason I'm excited about this technology is because it combines a lot of opportunities for new products in really large markets, together with very high technological maturity and really significant improvements that occur on almost a monthly basis. And uh, that's why in the next 40 minutes, I'm going to first give you a short intro, then I'm going to present just a taste into uh, some of the very interesting opportunities for using object detections for new application. And then I'm going to deep dive into the main part of the talk to give you intuition for the leading algorithms that are working today and wrap up with five guidelines that can help you take your first steps in the field more effectively and avoid rookie mistakes that I made when I started working on it. So these three technologies are actually the most mature technologies today in computer vision. And they are the engine behind the computer's capability to understand images. Classification is actually pretty much the base technology. Image classification is taking an image that contains a single object and then classifying it uh, to the object class. Is it a cat or a dog? Detection, which is the subject of our talk today, is taking an image that contains many objects putting a bounding box around each object and classifying each bounding box correctly. This is a classic image for image classification. And, uh, but to make computer vision really useful, image this really demonstrates that image, classi image classification is really not enough because, because the world is more complex than that. And it's really important to understand that object detection is not a futuristic technology. It's a, already a very mature technology, and we're already seeing it combined as a core component in many products we are all using, such as Facebook's face detection. And also in a rising products, such as self-driving cars, where in Google's case, uh, have already driven more than 4.5 million kilometers using object detection as a core component. Now I want to give you a a uh, small taste before we d deep dive into the algorithms for three of the really big opportunities for using object detection. Imagine how much more efficient the world of visual intelligence could be when computers using object detection will be able to speed up the work of the huge amounts of people currently analyzing these types of images by themselves. And the same thing goes for the world of healthcare. When, some, when today some of the most major bottlenecks are exactly where a human expert and usually a doctor is required to analyze images 
uh, um, uh, very high volumes of images by themselves and detecting very small findings. And this is an example of a detection of uh, the algorithm that we work on at ADOC, an urgent uh, uh, finding in a brain CT scan. Uh, but uh, this technology could help in a lot of other areas in healthcare as well. And the last example is robotics. And this example really blew my mind because in a series of papers, they showed that in order for a robot to wash your dishes, you will need him to find the grasping point on the spoon. And they showed in these papers that you can frame the problem of finding the grasping point on the spoon as an object detection problem. But this time, instead of the object being defined as the spoon as a whole, the object is, is defined as the grasping point. And this is the ground truth that was used to train these algorithms. And they used uh, some of the leading object detection algorithms almost as is, and it just worked. And I really think this demonstrates the sheer robustness of the object detection technology, because you don't have to limit yourself to uh, traditional objects with clear boundaries, and you can re really be creative with how you define your objects, such as grasping points. So this wraps up the introduction part, and now I want to uh, deep dive into the algorithms. And I uh, think that even for those of you who have read some of these, pa uh, these papers, how many of those are in the audience right now, by the way? Okay, great, not so many. So I, I really hope that even for those of you that have read some of these papers, I will be able to shed a new light about the intuition behind these algorithms. So let's begin. First, only two slides for, uh, as background for those of you without background in computer vision. So you, we, you will be able to follow the rest of my talk. This is a convolutional feature extractor, or in short, a feature extractor. And it is the brain behind uh, the, uh, all of the com different computer vision algorithms, whether it's classification, segmentation, or detection. This is the brain that lets the computer make sense of images. And it's built layer after layer. The first layer looks for the most simple features in the image, such as edges, lines, circles, the layers in the middle of the feature extractor use these simple features in order to construct and then look for more uh, features of growing complexity, such as these textures and even wheels. And the features in the last layer use the features from the middle layers in order to build the features of the highest complexity, such as faces of dogs and humans, and even this feature, which is a unicycle wheel with a human's foot on top of it. So this is a feature extractor. And when you put inside the feature extractor an input image, what is the output that you get? So the output of the feature extractor is a set of feature maps, actually thousands of feature maps. One feature map for every feature in the last layer of the network. And these are just three examples of these features. So you can see that for the feature of the dog face, the feature map that you get is completely dark because there is no dog in the input image. But for the feature of the unicycle wheel, the entire feature map is dark, except for this region that is very bright and corresponds to the area where the unicycle wheel is present in the input image. And this means that there is high presence of a unicycle wheel in this, this area of the image. And the output of the feature extractor is a 3D concatenation of all of these thousands of feature maps into a 3D feature map. So this wraps up the introduction for those of you without background in computer vision. So once we have the feature extractor, uh, and as I said, we, ha we used uh, this feature extractor for all tasks in computer vision. So this is an example of classification. If you want to use this feature extractor to perform a classification task, and this is really amazing, all you have to do is take the feature extractor as is, you don't need to change anything, and just plug in a, something we call a classification head on top of the feature map. And what is a classification head? A classification head is actually a neural network that takes uh, the feature map as its input and does something that is analogous to logistic regression. It, uh, it's the output of this neural network, the size of the output, is the number of classes that we want to classify into. And 
uh, we use an, an activation called the softmax activation in order to, fo uh, to force these outputs to sum up to one. So they will be able to represent the probability of classification per class. So this is a classification head. But I told you that we're going to talk about detection. And for detection, we need bounding box coordinates. So we need to regress those bounding box coordinates. And the intuitive way to do it is using a regression head. So what is a regression head? A regression head is very, very, a very similar idea to a classification head. And again, we use a neural network, which input is the feature map. Only this time, uh, uh, the outputs uh, for each bounding box, we have four outputs. And uh, this time, this neural network is, uh, for those of you with backgrounds in machine learning, is analogous to linear regression instead of uh, logistic regression. And we just use the linear activation because we don't want to bound these uh, outputs. We want them to represent coordinates. And for each bounding box, we get four outputs, x and y in pixels, which represent the coordinates of the center of the bounding box, and w and h also in pixels, which represent the width, the predicted width and height of the bounding box. So this is a very intuitive idea. And actually, the naive way to do regression is just to do it uh, just as well as we do classification. Just plug in the regression head uh, to the side of the classification head on top of the feature map. And this approach, it's uh, pretty amazing, but it works. It's so simple and it works. But the problem is that it do just doesn't work that well. So about three or four years ago, the top object detection experts in the world thought to themselves, deep learning, since it uh, has in was uh, introduced into the task of image, cl image classification, has driven significant improvements in the classification accuracy, in the, which is the main metric of uh, the image classification task. But we weren't able to see such improvements in the task of object detection. So their intuition was, if only we could reduce, and this is really important, to reduce the problem of object detection into a problem of image classification, then we would be able to leverage our achievements in image classification to the problem of object detection. So they wanted to reduce object detection into image classification, and that's exactly what they did. So they took the input image, and then used, they used a traditional computer vision algorithm in order to predict thousands of different bounding boxes on top of the input image. Find interesting areas with different heuristics, such as using the edges uh, of the image. And uh, then they just so many of these, these objects were just covering the background, but many of them happen to fall on the objects that we're actually interested in detecting. Uh, but uh, it's not really practical to output thousands of bounding boxes from the algorithm. This is a useless algorithm, of course. So what they did is then they cropped each of these thousand bounding boxes, and these are just three examples of cropped bounding boxes. They cropped them one by one. And now you can see that this image, any image classification algorithm, with, will have a very easy job classifying it as background. And this image, any image classification algorithm, will have a very easy job classifying it as a car. So actually, they, they were successful in reducing object detection into image classification. Because now, once we know that this bounding box represents a car, and this is a very easy task because of our uh, accuracy in image classification, we don't need to regress the bounding box coordinates. We already have the bounding box coordinates. That's how we crop this image. So this approach actually worked very well. And this is the full flow of the algorithm. You take the input image, and then you predict with the traditional computer vision algorithm thousands of bounding box all over the image. In parallel, you put the input image into, into a feature extractor and get the feature map. Then you crop each of these proposed bounding boxes, you crop it one by one from the feature map. These are four examples of cropped feature map out of the thousands that we are cropping. And then sequentially, you input each of these cropped feature maps into a classification head, which is a neural network. So you run this neural network thousands of times for each of the proposals and classify it. And then they showed that now, if you plug in the regression head in addition to the classification head, it even further improves the performance of this algorithm. Because now, the task of the regression head 
is not to regress the bounding box coordinates from scratch. We already have bounding box coordinates. The task of the regression head is only to take the existing bound bounding box coordinates and refine them. And that's a, that apparently is a much easier task. So the main idea and um, what, uh, okay, first of all, just to make sure you understood uh, all the little details, previously I showed you the classification head on top of the entire feature map. And now we put only a cropped feature map into the classification head, which means the input to the neural network is the cropped feature map. But apart from that, it's exactly the same idea. And same thing goes for the regression head. So to me, the most interesting, interesting thing in this paper is that and uh, this, this motive is also a major mo motive in all modern and leading object detection algorithms, is that if you are able to focus the neural network's attention into different parts in the image, then this enables you to reduce the object detection uh, problem into something that is only slightly more difficult than an image classification problem. And that helps you uh, solve object detection and actually, this, this approach has uh, brought the most significant improvement that was seen in years in the field of object detection. So this algorithm is called Fast RCNN, but don't let the name fool you, because one of its uh, most major problems was, were, was that it just wasn't fast enough. So. To demonstrate why it wasn't fast enough, I want to show you another video from the same TED Talk where he demonstrates an algorithm with a similar uh, speed. And you can see that the bounding box is accurate, but it's always just too late, even though it's not walking that fast. But even if your uh, application is not speed sensitive, speed is still very important for your algorithm because the faster your algorithm, the, uh, the faster your research pipeline will be, and the more experiments you will be able to conduct in a certain period of time. And in an empirical field like deep learning, it's very important to do as much experiments as you can because it uh, significantly increases your uh, chances of success. So a fast algorithm is very important. And now I want to show you how the leading algorithms today solve the problems of object detection accuracy and speed with faster algorithms. Is there, uh, is there anything about the computer vision based, uh, like bounding box computer that uh, has parameters that are also used, or that's just like a black box? Parameters? There are a lot of hyperparameters, yes. And, uh, but let's talk about it after I show the mo more modern algorithms, because it will be more interesting to talk about it then. OK? OK. So, how do we really solve the problem of detection today in all the leading algorithms? And uh, the leading approach is a sliding window approach. You take a sliding window and you put it on top of the input image. And I want you to just demonstrate what it, what it means that it's sliding. You just slide it to different locations around the image. And it's important to understand that once the sliding window is located in a certain place in the image, it's as if uh, each sliding window has a corresponding area in the feature map. And it's, uh, in a certain location of the sliding window, it's as if this part of the feature map is cropped. And only th this part is fed into the classification and regression heads. So this means that the classification and regression heads, when the sliding window is in this location, they are completely unaware that the rest of the image even exists. Okay, and this is very important to understand. So let the window slide, and you can see that when the window is in the first location, it, uh, it focuses the attention of the classification head onto an area which is clearly background. So it has a very easy job of classifying it as background. And same thing goes for the second location of the sliding window. And for the third location of the sliding window, you can see that the classification head's attention is focused on the person's head. And this makes it very easy to classify it as a person. And we'll talk about the uh, regression of the bounding box coordinates in a minute. So I want to skip a few locations of the sliding window. And the next location I will, I'm showing you is uh, just located on top of the, uh, the unicycle wheel. 
And again, because the attention of the, classifica the classification head is focused, then it's very easy to classify it as a unicycle wheel. So now let's talk about regression. Again, we already have bound pretty good bounding box coordinates because the coordinates of the sliding window are the coordinates for the, are pretty good coordinates for the bounding box around the unicycle wheel. So again, the job of the regression head is only to fine tune or refine these existing coordinates instead of regressing them from scratch. But now I want to show you a more interesting example. In the, when the sliding window is located on, above the person's head, uh, actually the bounding box we wanted to predict, uh, in many cases, is a bounding box that covers the entire person's body. But because the sliding window is small, we have no location of the sliding window that is even aware that there is an entire person's body in the image. So this seems like a real limitation of the sliding window approach. How can we predict bounding box coordinates to areas of the image that we are not aware that they exist? As an intuition, as humans we understand that it's enough for us to look at the head and shoulders of a person in order to understand if this person is standing up or lying down and in which direction. So this gives us information about the bounding box, even if we don't see the entire body. It's also enough to understand if this person is tall or short, which can give us information about the height of the bounding box that we need to predict. And I really believe that the most beautiful algorithms in uh, deep learning take a prior belief from our, the human intuition and find an elegant way to encode it into the network architectures. And uh, this intuition is uh, so significant that it, uh, this compo uh, the component that encodes this intuition is now a part of all leading object detection algorithms, and it is called anchor boxes. And these anchor boxes enable us to uh, solve not only this problem of uh, bounding boxes that are larger from the sliding window, but also many different prob problems of, uh, that uh, have to do with uh, predicted bounding boxes for objects with multiple scales and shapes. So uh, these two algorithms that I showed you are actually two examples of the two main types of object detection algorithms. And these types are the single stage algorithm and the two stages algorithm. The last algorithm I showed you that uses a sliding window approach is uh, actually uh, pretty much gives you the idea of the leading algorithms in the single stage. And the algorithms with the proposal I showed you is a previous generation of the two stages algorithm. And I will uh, show you the leading algorithm for the two stages approach uh, in a few minutes. So it's important to understand that these two types of object detection algorithms, single stage and two stages, actually sit on uh, different sides, typically, of maybe the most important trade-off in object detection, the speed accuracy trade-off. And the single stage algorithms are typically much faster uh, but less accurate than the two stages algorithm. And why are they much faster? It's because the sliding window approach can be implemented using convolutions uh, throughout the entire network. It's what we call in deep learning a fully convolutional network. So using only convolutions that are shared on top of the entire image is much faster than what we do in two stages, where for each of the thousands or in uh, modern algorithms, hundreds of proposals on the input image, we need to crop hundreds of or thousands of different parts of the feature maps, one after the other, and uh, feed them one by one into a neural network. So we need to run the neural network thousands of times instead of only once in this case. And this is why uh, this is uh, much more effic computationally efficient and fast. From the drawings, it might seem like we are cropping the sliding window location, but we are not actually cropping anything. We use convolutions to simulate cropping, but because we don't actually crop, we only run the neural network once, and all the computations are shared for the entire input image. So. Uh, there is one thing that is common between these two algorithms and that these two types of algorithms, and that, uh, that is that they both use attention 
focusing the neural network's attention, but they use different mechanisms to do it. The single stage algorithm uses the sliding window as the attention mechanism. And the two stages algorithm uses proposals on the input image as the attention mechanism. Uh, okay, so first of all, as an intuition to why the two stages algorithm is also more accurate, there are several explanations for that. Uh, one hand wavy explanation is that because you crop each bounding box by itself, and then you run each cropped bounding box through a neural network, this neural network uh, computes or extracts uh, features that are much more relevant locally to this specific bounding box. So it enables you to uh, get much higher accuracy for the uh, uh, refined coordinates of the bounding box than by this approach, which, uh, where all the convolutions involve features that are relevant to the entire image. So now I want to present you faster RCNN, which is uh, the evolution of fast RCNN, and it is currently probably the most accurate object detection uh, algorithm. And uh, you can see this is the full flow of the algorithm, and you can see that it actually looks exactly like the previous algorithm that I showed you, fast RCNN. That's because uh, the main difference between these algorithms, these two algorithms are not seen in this uh, image, and the main difference is that uh, is in the module that, uh, that gives us the proposals over the input image. And uh, how does it work? In FASTR CNN, we used a traditional computer vision algorithm to give us the proposals. And this approach had two problems. First of all, this algorithm was relatively slow by itself. And second of all, the accuracy of these proposals was very low. So we had to go over thousands of proposals with a new, uh, separately with the neural network, and that took a lot of time. So uh, faster RCNN, they decided to replace the traditional computer vision algorithm with a neural network that will give us the proposals. But not just any neural network. They used the single stage object detection algorithm as the proposal mechanism. They use the sliding window algorithm as the first stage that gives us the proposals. So uh, what, it, what uh, is going on here is that you get the input image, put it through a feature extractor, get the feature map, and then run the sliding window on top of the feature map uh, to get, this time, hundreds of bounding boxes on top of the image. The sliding window uh, is always the same size of window, yes. In, mo in most uh, leading implementation, the sliding window is always the same size, but uh, uh, it's some, I didn't dive uh, into all of the details of how you implement anchors. You can have, for each sliding window, you can have, instead of one regression head, you can have several regression heads, each of them uh, predicting one bounding box, and each of these regression heads can specialize, of, even though uh, it operates on a sliding window of the same size, if you have several regression heads, each regression head can train, during training, only on uh, di objects of different sizes. One regression head will, tra will train on large objects, and one regression head will train on small objects, and one regression head will train on wide objects. And uh, uh, because of the uh, intuition I showed you about anchors, a window of a fixed size is enough if you use anchors correctly. Okay? So uh, they used the sliding window approach in order to give us the proposal, and the classification head in this case doesn't classify into a thousand classes or a hundred classes or the number of classes that we has, have. It just cl classifies into two classes. And these are the classes that interest us in this stage. Is it an object or is it background? So now this, al this algorithm is much faster for two reasons. First, the sliding window approach works much faster than the previous traditional computer vision algorithm. And second, the, uh, the proposals from the neural network are much more accurate than the proposals from the previous algorithm. And that's why we now only have to go typically over between 100 and 300 proposals instead of thousands that we had to go in the past. Uh, 
And I remind you that each of these proposals, we need to run a, a separate uh, run of a neural network. So this is more than an order of magnitude of improvement in the number of neural networks that we need to run. So just to remind you, and uh, I close all the details in your head, this is the full flow of the algorithm. And it's pretty much exactly like FASTR CNN. But the main idea is using a neural network, which is the single stage object detection algorithm, as the bounding box proposal algorithm. And uh, now to wrap up uh, the part about the intuition for the algorithms, uh, and to give you uh, like um, uh, the common language that is required, the, most, the leading implementations for the single stage algorithm are called SSD, single shot detector, and YOLO. Yes, I'm not kidding. It's you only look once. And uh, for the two stages algorithm, the leading implementations are faster RCNN, which I just presented. And this algorithm was uh, the main component in all uh, winning entries in all object detection competitions in the last years. And RFCN, which is a really beautiful algorithm, but I don't have enough time to talk about it today. But I really recommend you to read the paper. Uh, OK. so the. The algorithms I showed you are really the state of the art of object detection. This is how it works. And I think it's surprisingly simple to understand the intuition. And uh, you, uh, you asked the question about, is it just a black box, or can we, uh, yeah? Uh, OK, so, well, sorry? The, 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 explain again. Uh, whether the. For the faster CNN, it's generated with the computer. Mm, the traditional computer vision algorithm? Oh, OK. So there's any parameters that are two along with the mm. or So actually, I don't have a really good answer for that, because I don't deal in my day to day with the traditional computer vision algorithm that, uh, that has generated the proposals, because this is the previous uh, generation of the algorithms. And no one really uses it for several years already. Uh, but for faster RCNN, which uses the single stage algorithm as the bounding box proposal algorithm, uh, there are a lot of hyperparameters which you can fine tune in order to get uh, better proposals. For example, I told you that uh, you can, um, I'll go back to the slide. So you can use, uh, I told you you can, you can put sev not one regression head, but several regression heads. And each of these regression heads will specialize on a different size and shape of objects during training. So you can play with the number of regression heads and with uh, the uh, uh, what exactly what size and shape each of them uh, specializes in. And uh, this is one example of how you can really improve uh, the network's uh, performance for proposals. Okay? But there are many other hyperparameters as well. So this wraps up the part about the intuition for the leading algorithms of object detection. And if there are two points that I would like you to, I recommend you to take from this part, take home, yeah, is uh, the first point is the importance of using an attention mechanism to focusing the neural network's attention into different parts of the image. And it's, uh, the, this uh, idea is combined into all the leading object detection algorithms. And it enables us to reduce the object detection problem into something that is only slightly more difficult than a classification problem. And that is a very important, uh, that, is a, that, was a ver that is a very important concept in object detection. And the second thing uh, is the speed accuracy trade-off. Uh, but I will talk uh, more about it in a minute. So my first guideline for those of you that want to really go in deeper into this field and start working is that, first, it's really important to be on top of the newest research in the field. Object detection is a very hot field of research. And these eight examples are eight examples, not, are not the only eight improvements for the, from the last year. These are, these are, in my opinion, only the eight most significant improvements from the last year in object detection. And I'm just going to, an ex as an example, to talk about one of them. But these are improvements that if you will be able to implement fast into your uh, product and algorithm, you will gain significant improvements uh, to your product. 
So this is actually a paper from about a month ago, and they showed that if you use a novel loss function uh, with the single stage algorithm, which it, until today, the single stage algorithm, as, as I told you, was uh, faster and less accurate. So they showed that if you use a novel loss function as the, uh, with the single stage algorithm, you are able to uh, gain better accuracy than any two stages algorithm seen until today and still be faster than all of the two stages algorithms. So using the loss function, th this new loss function, you are able to combine the speed of the single stage uh, detectors with the accuracy that until today was only seen in two stages detectors. And this is a really uh, significant improvement. And uh, it, it's uh, beyond the scope of this uh, talk to talk about uh, what exactly this loss function does, but it, uh, in a general idea, it has to do with um, dealing with the class imbalance because there is a very uh, large, there is a very significant class imbalance in, of ob in object detection for the sliding window. Most of its locations are seeing only background, and very few locations are seeing positive samples. So there is very large class imbalance, and this loss function targeted this issue and was able to uh, gain significant improvement. The second uh, guideline is that these algorithms were developed for the domain of everyday images. And most likely, if you will take these algorithms and work uh, in your companies, you will uh, probably try to adapt them to new domains, such like we do for medical imaging at uh, ADOC. And you need to really understand the basic assumptions behind these algorithms because they don't necessarily hold for your domain. As an example, I showed you that in order to classify this area as a unicycle, it's enough to see only the local context. But uh, in uh, medical imaging, even a human expert radiologist that look at a, looks at a CT scan, in order to classify and to detect a, an urgent finding in the brain, usually he needs to see not only the small area of that finding, he needs to see the entire image and, so, and many times even 3D context of many slices of the CT scan. And uh, this is not incorporate, incorporated by default into the traditional algorithms, and you need to understand all of these basic assumptions very well in order to understand how you do your adaptations uh, well. And the third thing is I really recommend you don't be fooled by declarations. Uh, in December of 2016, the two leading implementations, the papers behind the two leading implementations for the single stage algorithm, both said that they are outperforming or comparable to the state of the art faster RCNN. But that was actually not true. And the reason for that is that it is very easy, even in the best papers, to conduct, even by mistake, misleading comparisons. Uh, because there is not a single faster RCNN. Faster RCNN is an algorithm, and there are many hyperparameters that you can play with in order to increase its accuracy. So they, choose, they chose one, uh, one point, and they showed that they, are, they outperform it, but they didn't really outperform the state-of-the-art accuracy of Faster RCNN at that time. So in order to uh, deal with this issue, uh, I really recommend you to follow uh, the, Coco, uh, uh, the Coco Challenge leaderboard. The COCO challenge is probably uh, the main and most important challenge in object detection. And this challenge has to do with accuracy. And when I develop algorithms, I, I, I want, uh, when I choose the algorithm that I, uh, the idea that I want to incorporate in, into my algorithm, I want to be sure that they will, they will increase uh, my accuracy and that I'm not wasting my time. And when you uh, looked, when uh, in December of 2016, at the COCO leaderboard, none of the competitors, and definitely not the leading competitors, were using no, neither SSD nor YOLO. And I think this is a very uh, significant thing to understand. And the top five were using uh, uh, faster RCNN and RFCN, which are the two stages algorithm. Uh, but focal loss, the new uh, uh, loss functions that I talked about a few minutes ago, has, for the first time, enabled a single stage algorithm to get into the top five of the COCO leaderboard. 
And now I want to talk a little bit more about the speed accuracy trade-off. So I already told you that in order to choose your point of the, on the trade-off, uh, you need to choose between single stage and two stages algorithm. But it's not enough. Even your choice of the specific implementation will affect uh, your place on this spectrum. And there are many other hyperparameters that you can play with in order to choose your exact location on the spectrum. So I really recommend you to go to this paper by Google Research. And they uh, took dozens, if not more, of configurations of the different uh, types of algorithms together with different feature extractors and different hyperparameters for these algorithms and uh, compare these dozens of conf configurations in terms of speed and accuracy. So if you want to choose uh, your point wisely, I really recommend you to uh, learn from their uh, very thorough work. And the last point is that uh, if you will start working today on object detection, I really recommend you to use the TensorFlow Object Detection API. This is, uh, in my opinion, probably the easiest way to build object detection algorithms today. Within 10 minutes from when you will start uh, using it, you will already be able to download a trained faster RCNN or SSD or, all, or any other leading object detection algorithm and uh, use it with your own photos. And if you want to train it on your own data set, pretty much all you have to do, faster RCNN is already implemented. And pretty much all you have to do, they have an interface for faster RCNN feature extractor. It, it has only three abstract methods. And uh, all you have to do is Im implement these three very simple methods. For example, just to show you how simple they are, one of the methods is pre-process, which means how you want to pre-process your input image before you put it into the feature extractor, which is basically usually resizing it or maybe reducing the mean, normalizing it in some way or something like that. So this is a very simple abstract class that you need to uh, implement and you are already uh, able to start training on your own data. So to sum up my talk, I have four uh, short points. One is that object detection is a very mature technology and that there are a lot of new applications that uh, uh, are just waiting for someone to take them and do something with them. Number two and three are a little bit intertwined. And to uh, bring value from object detection, you don't need to reinvent the object detection, detection algorithms. They already exi exist. You need to take them and adapt them into a new domain. And adapting these algorithms into a new domain is hard, <coughs> but it's, uh, much less, uh, it's, much more, uh, it's much less hard than, uh, than inventing these algorithms. Inventing these algorithms took years, but adapting them to new domains is uh, much easier because the search space is much smaller and it's bounded by the existing algorithms and your intuitions about uh, your domain. And the last point is that uh, I uh, recommend you to use my guidelines, and I, uh, I hope that they will, uh, they will enable you to uh, start working much more effectively and avoid rookie mistakes that I made when I started working in the field. And the last thing I want to ask you before I go is which industry are you going to transform first? Thank you very much. Uh, do we have time for questions? Because, yeah, okay. First, thank you for a great lecture. It's very good to put that today. Uh, I have a little, uh, question. Um, are you familiar with such models that also output uh, other outputs other than bounding box? For example, I know size, power density, orientation, or other properties? Um, it's a different problem. Uh, but it's not necessarily such a different problem. I will just give a few examples. Actually, the state of the art, uh, it, uh, we, uh, we didn't have enough time to go, to go into the entire, entire complexity. But actually, the state of the art of object detection today is not only bounding boxes. It, it's now called uh, image understanding. Uh, so actually, uh, what, what, uh, the state, uh, the, what uh, a lot of people are trying to do today is for each object not only give the bounding box around the object, but also give what we call instance segmentation, which means we use, 
we, uh, uh, we do segmentation. We, for each pixel, we say if it's a person or a table or whatever it is, but we are also aware of the separation between the different people in the image. And uh, there are even other uh, things you can do, such as uh, with uh, very uh, similar frameworks, almost with no additions, such as human uh, key points estimation to understand where the joints of humans are from the, from the images. And um, 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 in, a, in a Facebook uh, AI uh, lecture, I also um, saw that they also take an image of a person reading a book and are able to understand what is the action the person is doing and what object it is, he is doing it on. So there are a lot of creative things that you can do. And uh, I actually put a list of resources here. And I'll uh, put a link to, this, uh, to these, uh, these slides uh, online in the Meetup page. And uh, these are just uh, the basic papers that I recommend you to look at if you're starting to work on uh, in this field. And these are the more advanced resources. And this is a very good lecture by maybe two of the really top experts in the world of object detection. Both of them work today in uh, Facebook AI. And uh, they show many examples of, uh, of uh, how to exactly implement the more creative ideas. But basically, for example, if you want to do human pose estimation, you just plug or instant segmentation, you just plug in another head on top of the network. So this is it's very simple. Uh, can you say something about the comparison between uh, the Yolo and the, and the SSD? Between specifically Yolo and SSD. Uh, so I didn't. I I actually don't know. I don't. I didn't read anything. Uh, any uh, really thorough comparison uh, between them because the only real comparison between them are in the, maybe the YOLO paper and the SSD paper. So it's very easy, as I said, to conduct misleading comparisons uh, because there are many working points you can choose. So I can't really say that. But uh, both SSD and YOLO are very similar, and they both uh, uh, they both use components that uh, the components that YOLO uses can be also used in SSD. So uh, you, you should look at it as the same thing and just try to take the best of both worlds. And it's, it's not really different algorithms. If you, were, if you want to implement a new algorithm, don't take YOLO as is or SSD as is. Try to look at what they did in the SSD paper, what they did in the YOLO paper, and create something new. OK, thank you very much.